Good evening. This week's Parsha is Parsha Shemini, the third Sedra of Sefer Vayikra. And we now uh, begin with the words Vayihi Bayom HaShemini. It was the eighth day. The eighth day to what? The eighth day to the Mishkan, to the Chanukah Samizbeach, to the Avoida in the Mishkan. And for seven days before, there was certain preparation which was part of the ceremonial beginning of the dedication and the celebration which began Rosh Chodesh Nisan with the Hakrava, with the carbon of Nachshon ben Aminada from the Shevet Yehuda. He was the first to bring it. It went then for 12 days. Now, the question is asked, why does it say Vayihi Bayom HaShmini? Why not Bayom HaRishon? Because that was the day that things began to really happen. The others were part of the beginning, but like the introduction. And it was in those days that Aaron was told with his two sons remaining, Hanosarim, um, Elazar and Isamar, who lived, Nadav and Avihu, died. They were tzaddikim gemurim. But they took into their own hands, the Medrash has like five different reasons why they died when they brought this katoris that they were not told to bring. But they were told to sit Shiva in those seven days before the Yom HaShmini. Now, we know traditionally, and the halacha is, that when a person hears that somebody in the family, lo aleinu, lo aleichem, died, that they, they become oinenim, that they don't have to do any mitzvah saseh or any mitzvah saseh, they don't put on tefillin, they don't this, they don't that, they don't uh, make brachas, they don't bench. But after the kvur, they become avelim, and that's when they have to continue doing the mitzvahs. And Aaron and his sons were told to sit Shiva before Nadav and Avihu even died. Now, why would that happen? So some of Forsham say that HaKadosh Baruch Hu didn't want the disturbance of the celebration that suddenly the boys die. Imagine if someone, I heard Rabbi Friend once gave an example to this that, that if somebody, the, a community was building a shul and then they had the dedication and suddenly a beam came down and two people were killed, that's the end of the celebration. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu didn't want that the celebration should be disturbed and that they would die and that they would have to immediately sit shiva. So he told them to sit before. And that paved the way, Kadmoinim say, because the Gemara says, that there is no marriage, no ksuba, that takes place without some sort of dissension. And we even find today that if there was such wonderful atmosphere between the machatonim, and there was never any issue that came up, not where to make the chasnam, when to make the chasnam, or to uh, differ an opinion, or be angry, or be upset about money arrangement, that if there was no problem up until the chuppah, before they march down to the chuppah, they find something the one mechutin to the other, uh, who's going to go first, who's going to go second, who should stand? They find some little issue that they create. 
just to be Makayim, what the Gemara says, the Leko Ksuba, the Lorame Be Tigra, that there's no such thing as a chasna taking place that doesn't have some bad feeling or some discussion or disappointment or something come up that they disagree on. So when there's nothing that happens, they create something little like insignificant just for 30 seconds to go through the motions to be Makayim. And where does that come from? Why can't there be a perfect ceremony? Some people are very nice. They don't make an issue of this. They don't make an issue of that. It comes from this, the Kadmonim say, that the children of, that Aaron and his two sons were told to sit Shiva before the burial, which never happens. No one sits Shiva before burial, but it happened over here. And that was in last week's Sedra, in Sav. The beginning of our Sedra, Vayihi Bayom HaShmini, is the eighth day after those seven days of Miluim, those seven days of Shiva, those seven days of what had to happen in preparation before the actual event of beginning the Avodah. Now Rav Moshe Feinstein, Zecher Tzadik V'Kodosh Levrocha, asked the question, why does the Pasuk begin Vayihi Bayom HaShmini? Why not begin Vayihi Bayom HaRishon? The first day, because it was indeed Rosh Chodesh Nisan, and it was the first day beginning all of the avoida that had to take place. So it should have said Rishon. Said Reb Moshe, and I once discussed it uh, with Rav David Feinstein, Zechet Tzadik Levrocha, his daughter went to my seminary, came all the way from the east side and had to leave her house seven in the morning because we began at eight, not nine. We began at eight. And he wanted very much to send her there. And it was a schos for us and an honor. So Reb Moshe said, because it was all of the effort in beginning the Mishkan, there were a lot of loose ends that had to be tied together. And we as Yid never discard the efforts of events and mitzvahs and avoid this Hashem for Klal Yisrael. You see, I mentioned to you one time many months ago that we have a different standard than most of the nations of the world. That means if somebody went and built a business and he was honest and he tried his best and he threw all of his money into the effort and was working 12 hours a day and then the business did not take off, it did not succeed, so we consider it a failure by the Goyim. But by Yidden we do not consider it that the hachana is as choshev as the thing itself. How it succeeds or doesn't succeed, we are not the Rabbana Shalom to ensure that it has to happen and that's the only way that the guy is looked up to. But we look up to the people who toil and work, whether it succeeds or not, because we are not in the driver's seat. Now, and that's why Rabbi Moshe said that by Yom HaShmini, we don't say it was the first day and ignore the seven days before, even if it was not the beginning of the actual Avoida in the Mishkan, but it was part and parcel of things that had to be done before the Avoida began. So things that are beginnings and efforts and toil and sweat and tears before the thing happens is as choshev as the thing happening itself. Now, we know that on that first day of the Avoida, there were three korbanos that were brought. 
Nachshon ben Aminadav Lamate Yehuda brought his korban, his shevitz korban. It was Rosh Chodesh, so there was a sa'ir for Rosh Chodesh. And there was for the Yemei HaMiluim a third. Now, Nachshon's korban was only for that day. And it wasn't every Rosh Chodesh. It was that first day Rosh Chodesh Nisan. The, the korban for the Yemei HaMiluim also was special for the dedication of the Mishkan. The third, the Sawyer, was every Rosh Chodesh. Now Moshe Rabbeinu, if you look at the few psukim in our parsha, parsha Shemini, it says that Moshe Rabbeinu turned to Aaron because it was right after the death of Nadav and Avihu. So Aaron was really, even though he already said Shiva, but he was in a Bechina of an Oinen. Oinen is the person before the burial, the family who has to say Shiva before the burial. And our Kodesh Baruch who told Moshe Rabbeinu um, to proceed with the regular Avoida, and Moshe Rabbeinu said, to Aaron, you have to bring and eat from all three carbonos. And at the end of the story, it says that Aaron ate only from the sa'ir of Rosh Chodesh. He did not eat from the two special carbonos. And the Pasuk says, Vayiktsof Moshe. Moshe got very angry and he said, why didn't you eat from the others? And Aaron answered him, and he didn't want to embarrass Moshe, so he was speaking to the two sons, like they were the problem, but it really was directed towards Aaron, and they understood, and Aaron answered him and said, my dear brother, I think you made a mistake. These two special korbanos, we had no right to eat from, as oinanim. And only the Sawyer for Rosh Chodesh did we have that right. And Moshe Rabbeinu suddenly, like thunder or lightning hit him, said, you are right. I forgot the halacha that I was told you should eat, and I forgot. So the Mephorshim are very praiseworthy. Don't forget, Moshe Rabbeinu, this story happened in front of about 100,000, 200,000 Yidden. This wasn't some private on the side little story. And Moshe Rabbeinu could have made cheshboinus. Oh, if I admit that I forgot the halacha, then who knows what Klal Yisrael, the whole Tzibor is going to say, who knows what else Moshe Rabbeinu forgot? If he forgot this, who knows if we, anything else was right? But he didn't go into those cheshboinus of putting down any person or trying to tie the blame on someone. But he just right away said, I did, and we find in Parshas Vayechi, that Yehuda became designated to have Malchus and Klal Yisrael, as Yaakov Avinu referenced it, and the Targum Yonason Ben Uzil over there in Parshish Vayechi says that when he gave Yehuda, Yehuda Yoducha Achacha, he gave him his bracha, he alluded to the fact that by Tamar, he acknowledged that when in front of the whole club, everyone that was there, and they said she committed adultery, she was a, she was a, she was a, a, in a state of Yavama, waiting for the youngest son to marry her. So she was really like a Bechina of Eishas Ish, and that she, 
was expecting and it was twins and she didn't want to embarrass Yehuda. She just said, whoever owns this staff and this money and, and this, uh, cl this um, staff and the money uh, and the chasim and the ring, that that's who I be, I'm expecting from. And Yehuda realized it was him. So instead of saying, what am I going to do? Make a chil Hashem and admit that I found some woman somewhere and I had a relationship. I could deny it. I could uh, appoint a committee. I could do something to get out of the terrible situation. But it says, tzad come me many, I admit, I am the one. And it saved her life and the two children's life, the twins inside of her. Mashiach comes out of one of them because he said openly in front of the whole Klal Yisrael, me many, it is I. And didn't look for any ways out to save his embarrassment and to avoid the public statement that was being made. And for that, Yaakov Avinu said, you will have Malchus. Because true leadership means that a leader could get up in front of everyone and admit he was wrong, admit he made a mistake. You know, when Reb Chaim Briska became the Rosh Yeshiva in Volozhin, so he had a derech, a different derech of limud than what was popular in most of the yeshivas in that day. And everyone was saying, well, the only reason he got the position of Rosh Yeshiva is because he's the, he married the Nitziv's granddaughter. And that's why he got it. And there was a tumult. So they called up Bezdin, and there were three big, of course, Dayonim, Chachomim, Talmide Chachomim, that were chosen, and they wanted Reb Chaim to say a shir to them, to prove that he was such an outstanding, and he said a magnificent shir. At the tail end of the shir, he remembered a Rambam that contradicted everything, his whole basis that he said. And he said, Rabosai, I have to, at the end of saying this, and they were all sitting there listening with such an intentive interest. And that, Rabosai, I was wrong. The premise of my Chiddush, the Rambam disqualifies, contradicts completely. And they answered him and said, you are Roy and should become the Rosh Yeshiva. Why? Because even if you think you made the mistake, you admitted it publicly and were ready to give up the job and the cover of Rosh Yeshiva and everything else. But you felt that truthfulness was the most important thing in the call of the moment. And they said, you will be Rosh Yeshiva. And he was the Rosh Yeshiva. So, Long term, sometimes it's only long term, sometimes it's short term, that we, for, we, we take a stand that we think is negative or it's embarrassing or it's humiliating and it's, but in long term or short term, we, we reap the benefit of what it is and we're able to carry on with how we should behave and how we should live our lives as shining examples uh, uh, especially in positions of leadership. Now, when when the pasuk says "Vayihibi, Vayihibi Yom Hashmini," Kara Moshe Liaron Levana Vulazikne Yisrael. Um, the Mephorshim are curious, why does it say Lexikne Yisrael? And also, Aaron HaKoyen, Moshe Rabbeinu Rashi brings it, 
turned to Aaron and said, why are you just standing there? Come and start the Korbanos. He had to bring an eagle lechatos and a, a, a soyer lechatos and a eagle, two Korbanos. And Rashi points out why an eagle, because as a kapora for the Misa ego, before they began the Mishkan, we know that part of the reason, one of the reasons of the Mishkan was a kapora for the ego. So he had to begin with that korban. And also a soir as a kapora, as Rashi brings the Medrash, for the fact that the brothers, a few hundred years before, like 600 years before, they shechted vayishchatu, that they shechted a soir, seir izim, and they dipped the cloak of Yosef in it to fool the father, thinking that some wild animal came and tore him apart, and, and here was his cloak of colors, uh, and it was with blood on it. And that's what they brought to Yag. So as a kapora for that. Now, the Meforshim answer and say that the Zikne Yisrael had to be standing there because how did they fall in to all of the problems that they had? They didn't recognize the wisdom, the chachma of the elders. When they made the eagle, Chor and others stood up and said, what are you doing? And they looked at him like an old man, and, and what does he know? And they killed him. When it came to the selling of Yosef, they made a Bezdin. But did they go to any of the Zakanim of the door? They could have gone to the yeshiva of Shem Ve'ever and asked them a Shaila. Yitzchak Avinu was still living. Why didn't they go to Yitzchak or to Yaakov, their father, and say, this kid, our brother, we think is committing crimes that he is roy to be killed and not to serve as themselves the Bezdin. And every, many tzaddikim said that every yid has to have a mashpia or a rov or a rebbe that when he makes decisions in life that he should not just look at himself in the mirror and say, well, this is what I think I should do. He should guide himself because every person thinks they know better. But the truth is, if they have the hakara, that we have a zokin, or we have a tzaddik, or we have a rosh shiva, or we have a rav, and he, even though he's old-fashioned, he doesn't have a computer in his house, he doesn't watch television, he doesn't know what's going on in the sports fields, he has no idea, but he has life experience, and he is drenched with das Torah with what the Torah would tell a person to do. And as we just said, Moshe Rabbeinu made a mistake also. He made a mistake, but he admitted it. But 99% of the day don't make a mistake. And when they give guidance, it's for the good of the person. And over here, they could have avoided by the eagle and by the Mechiris Yosef. So much so, if they would have just asked, and they had who to ask. They had levels of madrigas, of, of tzaddikim to ask, but they didn't. So that's why in the beginning of the, Moish, of the Mishkan, the Pasuk says, Kara Moshe le'aron u'levanav u'lezikne Yisrael. I mean, the Klai Yisrael was standing there. Why did he have to have the Zikanim come out separate? Because he said, you're going to bring a Korban now for two events 
that terribly affected Klal Yisrael. I mean, the fact that they sold Yosef HaTzadik, the Zoyar HaKodesh, as I've said to you on numerous occasions, says that there was no Malach and Shemayim that could affect a punishment for these shift they caught because they were so holy and so great. So they had to be in this goggle to 1700 years later as Tanoim they were killed in the Sora Ruge Malchus. So it could have been avoided by the advice and the leadership of Tzaddikim living at the time. And somebody, there was a Rav Weinberger in Williamsburg who was a Rav of a shul in Williamsburg. He was not a Hasidish, he was a Talmud of Torah Vedas, and he was around 25, 30 years older than myself, Lahavdal ben Chaim Lachaim. And he said in his Sefer, Shem and Hatov, that when we think of the word survivor, we think, let's say, of Holocaust. He was a survivor. He lived through the Holocaust and he was able to continue on with his life and have a family and do this and do that. He was a survivor. But the truth is that the lesson I mean, Hitler, he wanted to wipe out every Yid. He, his mission was to wipe out every Yid. So pointed out, Rev Weinberger, that we today, 100 years after, 75 years after Hitler, we are survivors also. Because he didn't want us to be here 75 years later. So what is the obligation of a survivor? And that's why he said in this parsha that when he talked about a lozer, the Torah talked about a lozer and a summer, it says hano sarim, the survivors, meaning in the Pasik that Nadav and Aviu, two brothers died and two brothers lived on and they were the survivors. So he points out that there's a mission designated for every survivor. That means when we walk down the street with a yamulka, and we open the door or hold the door for someone walking through with a cart of food and needs the assistance, that's survivorship. You are being Makadish Shem Shamayim Barabim, with each and every deber, each and every maisa that you do, and that's hanosarim. That is the concept of survival, to show that you are continuing the dvar Hashem, the mitzvahs Hashem, and the avoidas Hashem. And that is what enriches our daily life. You know, some people come to a point in their life that they say, I mean, every day the same thing. Okay, I put on the trill and I dive, and so what am I doing? Well, that question is a healthy question because sometimes it awakens within the person purposefulness in his life. And I'll tell you a story that just happened 10 days, two weeks ago. I got a call from someone who lives in Lakewood. His name is Pinchas Jurowitz, a wonderful Yid, a Litvish Yid, probably around my age or maybe a few years younger. And he says, Reb Yoshua, I have a cousin who's in the nursing home on 56th Street and 15th Avenue and he's 80 years old and he never in his life missed putting on tefillin and he's been asking for like three four days for tefillin and no one has brought him the tefillin so I want to ask you because we know each other 
would you be willing to, to send someone there to put the tefillin? He doesn't have the tefillin. That's why he's not putting it on. And I said, Reb Pinchas, no problem. I'll be happy to, to get somebody. And I called up Easy, which is a local car service here. And I said, send me a driver, because Easy has only Jewish and from drivers. Send me a driver. So he sent me a driver. And in comes a fellow, an Israeli. He's lived here for a number of years. His name is Yoini. And Yoini comes in and says, Rabbi Bolkany, what could I do for you? I said, here's a pair of tefillin. I want you to take them to a block and a half away from my house. And I want you to put the tefillin on a man named such and such. And he went to the nursing home, and he calls me that I told him the guy's first name is David. Uh, and he said, no, it's this and this. Whatever. Anyway, he found the man he put on the tefillin, and he comes back to my house, and he's crying. Now, a lot of Israelis, once they've gone to the army, and they, they don't cry so easily. I said, Yoni, what happened? He said, today is the yard site of my father, his shloishim. And my father never missed a Friday going to put on tefillin for people in the marketplace near where we lived in Israel. And I, I davened today for the Omid, of course, and said Kaddish, and I gave L'chaim. But I've been asked, and I asked myself in Shul, what can I do for my father? I'm not so learned, so don't tell me to learn a Mishnah. And today, when you sent me to put on the tefillin on this Yid, I burst out crying. And I haven't cried for a long time. By my father's death and funeral, I cried. But very few, far and few occasions. But when it hit me that this was one of the special things in my father's life, and why didn't I think of it? And you called me to put on the tefillin for this yid that was so sad that the first time in his life he missed putting on tefillin. You made my day so purposeful in honor of my father, Le'ilu Nishmaso. So a person is sent events that this boy Yoina, that didn't with his own mind, maybe he was a tumult, maybe he was busy, I don't know why. He didn't think of doing something for his father. And he went and was the one chosen to come to me to put the tefillin on. This man who was dying to put on the tefillin because he never missed in his lifetime. So we have to look and think for a moment, how can we make our days more purposeful and bring to life why we are alive and why we have been given another day in the days of uh, the history and the moments that were given here in Olam Hazeh. Now, we know that in this sedra, it's the first place that the kosher animals and birds are listed. It's listed again in Devorim and Re'eh, but this is the first time. And one of the birds is called Da'a. 
And Rashi points out because in Re'e, later on, when it lists the same Pasuk, it doesn't call this bird Do'a, it calls him Ra'a. So Ra- Rashi asks, why if his name was listed as Do, why are we now calling him Ra'a? And he answers and says, Sheroy Yoshev Bebavel, that he lives outside of Eretz Yisrael in Bavel, Chutzel Oretz, Veroya Nevela Be'eretz Yisrael. And it means he has keen vision. He could see 40 miles away, 60 miles away from right outside Eretz Yisrael, Bavel, and Eretz Yisrael, and he could see what's going on. He sees the Nevela, the carcass. So all the Mephorshim ask, why doesn't Rashi just say, who's quoting a Chazal, by the way, that the Chazal should have said, if you want to say he has keen vision, say he Yoshev Bevavel, Veroya Be'eret Yisrael, the Beis Amigdash, the Harabayas, the, 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 the mountains, the Horim, the this or that, in Eretz Yisrael. Why does it cite in wanting to accentuate the strength of his vision and stress the word nevela? Say the word nevela. Why? And the Mephorshim say, because it's a message to us. Of course, we could have just said it has excellent supervision. But we wanted to say, like so many people that you hear sitting around the table, in Eretz Yisrael, they should have done this and done that and so many calamities because of all the Friar Yidden and so many bad, so much bads going on, Neged HaTorah. And, uh. and what the Chazal wanted to stress was If you're living out of Eretz Yisrael, don't be like this treif animal, this treif bird that sees from outside, inside only the negativity, the nevela, the bad, the negative. But be a promoter of a positive vision and view on events. And if you want to talk about something, Someone's a Tinnik Shanishpa. Cite the many, many, like there's been maybe thousands. I heard, I heard myself at least maybe 30 or 50 different stories since this terrible, terrible, tragic event of October 7th of the people who suddenly became from. That they lived in a kibbutz, that everyone was, that was killed, and they were the only ones saved. And they got up the next day and they started to light Shabbos candles and put on tefillin, throw out all their trade dishes and only cautious and doing a wake-up call. But we have to train ourselves to shape and mold that which we see and say down the positive lane, not the negative lane. Now, as mentioning that we're talking about Kashras so much in the Sedra that we know that there was a letter sent to the Rambam's son, Rebbe Avram. And the city who sent it to him, the Rambam was not living at that time. He had just passed away. They wrote to him that there's a terrible plague in our city and children especially are dying left and right. And Rabbi Avram, this Ben Harambam, wrote back to them that the cause must be that something is going on in the city and people unknowingly are eating treif. And they searched, and they suspected, and they checked out, and they investigated, and they found, indeed, 
that there was a butcher who was bringing in treif meat and they were eating it. And as soon as they stopped him and it was no more a problem, the children and the people stopped dying. There was almost every day they wrote in their letter a Levaya taking place. Because you see, Kashrus is not only a love, and in most times you should know people say to me, well, I ate a, a treif steak, but it's only a love, because it, it was from a cow, and a cow was a kosher animal, but it wasn't shechted, it wasn't prepared, so it's treif. But that's a love with Malchus. But the truth is that most people who eat steaks that are not kosher, around the steak there's chalev. And chalev is not a lav, it's an iser chorus. It's an iser diaraisa. I mean, the treif is also an iser diaraisa, but, but there's an iser chorus, which is much, much more severe than the iser of a lav. So it's not just that. It's metamtem delev. There's two things that the chazal, the mekubolim, underscored that is metamtem delev. That's unionship, intimacy, improper, and it can be with a husband, with a wife. It doesn't have to be chas some outside person. That they're not carefully keeping the halachas of when and what and how and everything and that is metamtem the lev. And then the foods that are eaten. And it doesn't say it by Shabbos. And it doesn't say if someone doesn't put on tefillin that he's metamtem his lev. But it says it by these two things. And a person has to realize that being metamtem the lev is something that saturates and drenches the neshama with like spiritual ruchnius dika poison. And, you know, on the radio once I was asked, how could it be that there's so many yidden that are, are for someone like Biden that is anti-Israel and he did such terrible things and all of that. And I answered them simply because after all of those lobsters and the shrimp and the ham and cheese, they're so ungestopped, they're so packed and piled up with tim tum alev that in Ruchnius they cannot think straight. And that's why their deities are lawyers and doctors, smart people, bright people. And it comes to something, you look at it right, black and white, that, I mean, just look how the Israelis treated all of the, the Palestinians, all the Arabs went into all of those Arab villages that the children never had dentistry with mobile units to give them dentistry and to straighten their teeth out and clean their teeth and fix their cavities and do all the, and they're doing all these type of things and be looked at like the most merciless people against the Arabs. And let's remember, all Israel wanted was to live in peace. They never started a war unless a war was about to break out against them. So foods that we eat have a direct effect on our thinking and our emuna. Because emuna can pick up the level of every person's existence. You know, certain things are supposed to happen to people in certain times of their life. But their emuna and their bitochen, if it's strong enough, can circumvent those events and supersede the event of what is about to happen or what's supposed to happen. Because it dissolves the opposition. Now the greater, and that was the mile of tzaddikim, that they were able, I mean, just look in Eretz Yisrael, the last 10 tzaddikim, 
that were Nifter and Eretz Yisrael were 90 plus, and five of them were 100 and plus, and with living simple lives, not going on vacations, and not relaxing, and not easing up in their Torah learning, and all the things they did for Klal with all the Tsaris of Klal Yisrael, they lived to 103. Rav Lefkowitz, uh, Rav uh, Chaim Kamene uh, Kanievsky, uh, Rav uh, uh, Michal Yehuda Lefkowitz, I said, Rav Steinman, Rav, uh, all of these tzaddikim, and the Lubavitcher Rebbe and the Satmar Rebbe, they lived into their 90s. And these were people didn't vacation, and were, they're taking on the tsaris of Klal Yisrael on their shoulders. But they were people to be able to supersede. So the most effective re-energizing and re-increasing the level of emuna and the effectiveness of all of that positive emuna and the opposite, the eating of treif, which tears away at the amuna because it's metamtem de lev. So we have to really go out of our way. And the Gemara in Yuma says that there was a lady on Yom Kippur who was expecting, and she suddenly had a terrible urge to eat. So Rav Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbeinu HaKadosh, went over to her, the Gemara says, and whispered into her ear, today is Yom Kippur. And the woman internal, internalized it to such a point that the desire from the whiff of the treif that she smelled and was dying to eat withered away completely. And from that pregnancy, that woman who did not eat, that child that was born was Rav Yochanan. And we know how big Rav Yochanan was of the biggest, biggest Amoroyim ever to be. Because Rabbeinu HaKadosh was the tail end of the Tanoyim. So that next generation was Amoroyim. And he was, he, that's Rav Yochanan, Rav and Rav Yochanan throughout Shas. Their differences of opinion and everything that took place, uh, Reish Lokish and Rabbi Yochanan. So that's what the Gemara says. But then the Gemara continues and says that there was a woman, the same case, and they went over and they whispered into her ear, it's Yom Kippur. But she says, but I must eat. So she ate and the Gemara says that child that was born when she was expecting, was a Russia in his life, and his name was Shabsoi. And what was a sign of what kind of a Russia he was, says the Gemara, he was an Otsar Peri, that he cornered the market of fruits and vegetables. Fruits, says Peri. Now, if the Gemara would have said that we want to tell you what kind of a Russia he became, we said it was Machal Shabbos or he caused other people to do this Aveira, or that Aveira. But to say that the, the, the pinnacle, the turret of an example of how bad he was is that he cornered the market, that he controlled the price, and then he got the entire market and he was able to ask the exorbitant prices and he became very, very wealthy. I mean, it wasn't very nice of him and it wasn't maybe, it showed what kind of character he was, but does, is that the paradigm example to show us what a Russia he became? So the Kadmoinim's answer, the Meforshim answer, on the Gemara there, that that example showed the essence of his character that the world began with him and ended with him. 
and that there was no limit to desire because he was a wealthy man. Why did he have to corner the market of fruit? He had plenty of money. And the answer given is because he never limited what it was never enough. Now, seeing the two examples in the Gemara, you see that one woman, and the Gemara calls it a sarkana, and if a woman says, I must eat it, we give it to her. She changed her mind and subdued that burning desire. So that's why she didn't need it. But the other one didn't want to pull back. But it shows us from the first story she could have pulled back. We go with the halacha. I mean, look, if 30 doctors say that a woman just gave birth and it's Yom Kippur, and the 30 doctors say she does not have to eat, and the woman says, I must eat, we feed her, we give her food. That her feeling of how she feels if she can survive on the day or the second day after giving birth on Yom Kippur, we listen to her, even if 30 doctors say the opposite. But a person, excuse me, in each direction has the ability to direct the traffic in a positive way or not. She has to be honest about it. That means if she really feels she's going to die, she has to say so, and we give her to eat. But the person who doesn't, many times it's just the state of mind. And if they properly think they can go the right direction, it's Yom Kippur, don't eat. And she didn't. And that's why she gave a, a birth to a child that had no, lim no limit on his desire either. So foods play a very, very positive effect. We're mala all the nishamas in food. It's the vehicle for many nishamas who did not make brachas. Like, the, like Reb Shlomka Zvil once walked in Yerushalayim. And he always walked with a group of people. Some people were with him. And this was like a super Baal Ruach HaKodesh. And he used to walk down the streets and point that that bird on that tree there is still waiting for an Amen to a Borein of Fashos, and that's why it hasn't gone into Gan Eden. And he told the people, and there were people up to just a few years ago who remembered the event as little children. Reb Shlomka was a nifter in 1945, which is 75 years ago. But if somebody today is 50, uh, 90 years old, he could have been a bar mitzvah boy and been there. And th there were some people, I met one of them near the Koisel once, who told me, yeah, I was there when he pointed at the bird and somebody went and took an apple, made a bore priya eights, and we all answered, amen. And then he made the bore nefashos that that neshama forgot to make at some point. And we answered, Amen. And then Reb Shlomka said, now he's back in, he's in Gan Eden. So foods can be the best vehicle, but it can also tear a person down to the ground to levels that are the most unbelievable levels that a Yid could be in Olam Hazeb. Now it says that when, our, when Moshe Rabbeinu says, why aren't you coming in? He says, because the Shekhin is not there and I know it's not there because of me. So Moshe Rabbeinu said to him, but you were chosen. Go over and do the Avoida. And Aaron said, I really think it's because of me because I was by the eagle, and I was buying time. I wanted to stall the people. I was positive you'd come back shortly, but I didn't succeed. But because I was participating, even with the best intention, it was still bringing about the eagle. So because of that, the Shechina doesn't want to come down. So Moshe Rabbeinu said to him, L'kach nivcharta, and many of the Bali Musser, 
point out and they say that why did he say Lakach Nivcharta that you were chosen to be now the Kohen Gadol? He was talking about the fact that he didn't want to go over. Because you are hesitant, because you feel that you are not tzaddik enough, you are not roy enough because you were standing there by the eagle, Lakach Nivcharta, for that reason you were chosen to become the Kohen Gadol. And we have to look at sometimes we trip and sometimes we do not behave the way we should and we sometimes repeat even though we know wrong and we know sometimes that, but we have to continue pushing ourselves in the direction of the tshuva that gives us a true mission of avoidus Hashem with a purity. And then we're able to move on and to do what we have to do in our lifetime. Now, the Pasuk says that when the two children, the two sons of Aaron, the Tzaddikim Gemurim, that they died, so it says, the Pasuk says, Vayidom Aaron, Aaron kept quiet. So the Medrash asks on that, Vayidom Aaron, that he kept quiet and you're mashabeach him, you're, pra you're praising him. What mahava leila meimar? What could he have said? Let's say he did say something. What could he have said? Was he going to say, Hashem, what did you do to me? Uh, why did this happen right now to spoil the Hanukkah's Hamishkan? And, uh, so the Medrash answers and says, what could he have said? He could have said the second Pasuk of our Sedra, uh, of last week, of, of next week, Sedra, Uvayom Hashmini Yimol Besar Orloso, that a baby on the eighth day has his bris. Eighth day, so since as the Gemara Darshans, that since it says eighth day, that means eighth day, even if it's Shabbos, you're not allowed to cut something that produces blood on Shabbos, but for a bris, you do it. And not shot that with bidiyeva, that's the lechatchila. I mean, of course, if a child is, is not well, or a baby is still yellow, or something like that, then you're not allowed to make a bris. Chas Shalom, you can put the child into a sakana. But if the child is well enough, then we do it on Shabbos. Because the Pasuk says, Uvayom HaShemini. Now, why in the world does Aaron, does the Medrash say that that's what he could have said the moment that his sons were killed? And the Meforshim explained that Midiraisa, a woman, is muteris to her Baal after giving birth on the eighth day. We know chas v'sholem, it's an iser chorus, if uh, there's intimacy, a husband and a wife, eight days after, she has to wait much longer and go to the mic, everything. But Midiraisa, according to the strict halacha of the Torah, not of all the Isurim of Chazal and the Gemara and everything, that the eighth day, why? So the Gemara explains that Medrash talks a lot about it, that when a person, that why wasn't the bris the first day? Why did the Torah say the eighth day? Why not the first day? The baby's born, take the baby and give the bris. So the, the Mephorshim explain that the whole reason it's the eighth day is since a woman becomes muteris labala, that the frame of mind of the husband and wife will be different, more comfortable, knowing that they are able to have, to be intimate, that that will springboard their frame of mind to a state of happiness while the bris is taking place. And that's what the Chazal answer, why it's not the first day and it's the eighth day. So Aaron could have said 
that you made the eighth day a bris to make the Bali Simcha, the father and mother, happy, because that's when they're muteris, they're mutter, one to another. So now why in the midst of the heightened Simcha of the Chanukah HaMishkan, are you doing such a thing at that moment when we're supposed to be at the height of our Simcha? And the point that we learn out from it is that many people are at simchas, at chasnas, at bar mitzvahs, at pidyan haben, at different things, sheva brachas, and somebody feels that they've got to inject negativity. You know, you hear from me a lot about negativity and positivity, that they have to know that Vayidom Aaron, he could have said, the Medrash says it, Ma hava le what could he have said? And that's what the, the, the Medrash answers. So we have to take away from that, that moments that people have in their lives, and it could be every single day. You're supposed to smile at a person when they ask you how you are and say, Baruch Hashem, I got out of the bed and Baruch Hashem, I ran to Davin and Baruch Hashem, I'm going to help someone, I'm Baruch Hashem. You turn in the hours of the day into something which is totally positive. And our days and our minutes and our time and our events should be drenched with that simcha.